Uh, hey, everybody. Um, so I actually asked David to come present um, this presentation. I saw the the HUD for Zap. Um, uh, he did a talk at AppSec, uh, AppSec, uh, or was it B sides or AppSec? No, it was, it was B sides San Francisco, and uh, it's super cool. Uh, and then I asked him to kind of build a, a separate part of the presentation, which was how to use Zap for Burp users, um, because not everybody can afford, you know, even what is the relatively cheap license of of Burp. And these days, actually, Zap is is so full featured, and uh, it's absolutely free, maintained by a great community that responds super fast to things that you need inside of Interception Proxy. Uh, and I have been forcing myself to use it over the last 30 days because of just some random um, crappiness with how some Interception Proxies handle SSL. And I have been like super pleasantly surprised because um, I hadn't touched it in a little while. And now I'm I'm thinking about switching over. And you guys all know that like an Interception Proxy is pretty much like a core part of, of your tool set. So, um, I'm interested to see um, this presentation and, um, you know, see how, you know, as a primary burp user for many years, um, I could utilize Zap a little bit better in, in my work, work cycle. So that's why we asked David to come over. Um, I've been with Dave, Dave for a uh, little while now. Um, he came to my bug hunting class really recently um, at um, AppSec uh, Cali and um, just an all around smart and great dude. So uh, looking forward to this. Thanks. Thanks for being here, David. Yeah, thank you for the intro. Uh, so excited to be here. Uh, talk Zap, talk about heads up display. Um, it's going to be exciting. Great. So yeah, I've got uh, this talk kind of split into two separate talks. So for this first half, I'm going to be talking about um, Zap for Burp. And the second half, I'm going to be talking about the heads up display, um, which is really what I spend a lot of my time on. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about that. So let's dive into Zap for Burp. Or if you looked at a little bit more exciting slide, I want to look something like this. So this is like a really hacky uh, uh, Photoshop job I put together, but I made it. I wanted to squeeze it in there somehow, right? Um, and so a little bit about myself. Uh, I work at a company called Segment doing security engineering. And I'm a member of the uh, kind of the core contributing team for uh, OWASP Zap, the Z Attack Proxy. Um, and I spend most of my time working on the heads-up display and less so much uh, the core desktop proxy. Um, but through my time working on it, I've still picked up a lot about it. And I think there's a lot of neat things to share um, that like someone who's used Burp and just kind of heard about Zap might not be familiar with. So first, um, kind of want to get into this zap versus burp mentality, right? I think it's kind of silly. Um, some people have used both tools um, or only use one to kind of like, you know, which one's better or worse, right? Um, and in my mind, when I kind of hear this conversation, I think, I mean, are they really that different? Um, I mean, we have burp on the on one side here and zap on the other. And I think if you were to show someone who had never seen either one of these tools, show them burp and then quickly, you know, uh, wave the hands and pull up a uh, zap. I don't really think they would know the difference. Um, both built on Java, um, similar uh, sets of features. Um, but by the same token, when we compare these things, sometimes I even think, I mean, are they really that similar? I think um, each ones have, each tool has its uh, pros and cons on the thing it does really well. Um, and kind of understanding those, I think, will help um, better suit like which one's best for you. Um, or if uh, you only, if you do have to pick one, um, kind of what are the different with the what are the differences between the two? And so I kind of created this uh, this quick little chart of comparing the two. Um, so the first and most obvious point, and the one Haddix points out, is that Zap is free. Um, all the features, the whole thing. Um, no money at all. Um, whereas with Burp, uh, while the community edition is free, uh, it does still cost $400, right, for the um, pro license, which a lot of the features and functionalities are going to be hidden in there. The second core difference is who's building these tools and who's supporting them. And so Zap is completely open source and powered by a community. Uh, so there's a group of uh, probably a handful, uh, somewhere between, you know, four to a dozen people who really spend time uh, contributing on it. But 
these people are either doing it, um, working on it because they got a grant that gives them time, their company is allowed for them to work on it. So Simon Bennett's uh, the project leader. Yeah, he has a few days a week, he's able to work on it. Um, or people like me who just do it in their spare time. And that's gonna be a much, create a much different product than um, some, a team like Burp, right? Which it's closed source, but as a full team of developers uh, building it out. Um, and so some of the different uh, flavors and varieties between the two, um, some of these things kind of like UI UX, I think kind of can be explained by these buckets, right? Like who's got the time and the resources. Um, but one pro that I've seen uh, from the community build side is that because anyone can contribute or to contribute, um, you can iterate really quickly. Um, and someone might build a whole new feature um, that just gets built in uh, because they've decided to build on their own time. They're not stuck to some other roadmap. A few things that are different um, that really can't compare apples to apples or more apples to oranges, just pros of each tool, I think. Um, so when we're talking about wanting to automate or do any like CI CD stuff, like the REST API for Zap is like the place to go. Um, it is extremely powerful. And I'll be showing that off um, during this presentation. Um, and on the flip side, I mean, Burp has a really strong group of documentation. And that's one that I think the reason it's hard to uh, go into Zap from Burp is um, it's just really thorough documentation by the Burp team. They do a great job with that. And Zap is also, uh, internationalized into over 20 different languages. And as far as I know, I don't think Burp is powered in other languages. I could be wrong there. Um, but there's a strong focus by the Zap team uh, to make sure that Zap is available for a bunch of different countries. Burp's uh, uh, extension community is really powerful. When you look at the extender tool and you look at the, uh, the Burp um, app store, uh, lots of great contributions back by the community there. And Zap has uh, this new feature called the HUDZIP display, which we'll be talking about, which does actually change the way you use the tool so much. It's worth putting on this list and what differentiates the two. And definitely stay tuned in for the whole talk to catch about the heads up display, uh, which I'll get in about 25 minutes. Another thing I think that Burp gets a leg up on is the intruder tool. It's really well built um, for people to understand how to dive into it and the different tools about it. And even though I think the it's easier to start using Intruder and Burp, all that same functionality is in Zap. You just have to know how to use it. And I'll, I'll be talking about that. And the final point is that Zap is really focused on WebSockets. So while Burp has the ability to see um, the WebSocket history and um, yeah, Zap has the ability to intercept WebSockets. We're building passive scanning rules for it. Active scanning rules are coming out. So there's a really strong focus on making sure there's good WebSocket support with Zap. Cool. So now I want to dive into just some Zap basics. So how to get started with it? Um, what are some like key principles to keep in mind when you're using Zap? And a quick overview of the UI. And then we'll start going into kind of feature parity after that. So getting started, uh, to download and install Zap, very easy. You can go to this link right here. There's installers for Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, there's like a cross-platform one that's all Java. And there's even a Docker image you can run to get started with Zap. And plug Zap 2.8, which is going to be all of the features that have been built in the last like year and a half, maybe two years. This is coming out, uh, it's scheduled to come out next week. So if it doesn't come out next week, it'll be the week after. And um, I'll be de all the things that I'm, uh, screenshots I have here are from Zap 2.8. So definitely check that out. If you've used it in the past and you kind of have a, a feeling about it already, see what's different in Zap 2.8, you might like it. So once you start up Zap, um, after you've installed it, this is what you're gonna see. And this is Zap 2.8 right here. What we'll see is in this quick start menu, we have these different options you know, to learn more, um, but we just wanna start proxying, right? We just wanna go right to the site and see what happens. So we're gonna use the manual explore option. And choose manual explore, it'll pull up in this little window for you here. And you can punch in the URL that you wanna start testing against. In this case, you wanna make sure the HUD button is disabled if you don't wanna use the HUD. If you check it, it'll enable it. And then by pressing launch browser, it's uh, automatically gonna launch either Firefox or Chrome, whichever you choose. And it's pre-configured to be proxying through Zap. 
So you don't need to uh, export any SSL certificates. You don't need to import them into your browser. Uh, it's all ready to go. Now granted, if you want to do that because you like the browser, you test it and you have a bunch of other plugins, you're still welcome to do that. You can still uh, export the certs and import them. But if you just want to get going right out of the gate, you can press launch browser and you're ready to go. So some key principles to keep in mind when you're using Zap. So the first one is to right click on everything. Uh, Zap is built to have a bunch of information and more functionality hidden in these context menus. And I think that's best shown how far they go with that is when we use, uh, we have the requests response up that we've been intercepting or looking from uh, our history. If you just highlight a parameter in that and right click on it, that's gonna be provide a different context menu than if you just right clicked anywhere in that request because now it's gonna show this fuzz feature. It's gonna note this a parameter and customize this context menu to give you more functionality. And then it just goes uh, a long way to show why you should right click on everything if they're kind of building that kind of level of detail into it. I also mentioned there's an API for basically everything you can see in the UX. Um, this is the REST API. And so if you've got a browser proxying through Zap and you type in uh, HTTP Zap slash UI, you'll see this uh, graph representation of the um, API. And these, are, these aren't endpoints, these are categories of endpoints that you can do to control the functionality. So if you're really into scripting some things or you wanna start building any sort of automation, this is where I would start. And if you were to click into one of these categories, the number of endpoints is ridiculous. So this is just some of the endpoints from one category. So you can imagine just how much more there are. When you click in on one of these, it's really nice. It provides you with this graphical uh, representation of the API that you can then kind of test right in the browser. It returns you some pretty JSON for you to understand what's going on. So you can kind of a better understand um, how the API works before you start scripting against it. The final thing is just look for the help page. Uh, because documentation, um, I think, isn't as strong in Burp, it can be uh, you might get frustrated looking for it, but Zap 2.8, if you go to the help menu in the search, it's really cool. I was playing with this earlier today, and uh, if you type in uh, something in that search field and kind of scroll down, it'll automatically start opening up the menu to show you where it is inside. Like, I didn't mark this up. This is an actual straight screenshot from Zap, and uh, that's really powerful. So just find the help page or go online and find a community. This Zap community is really strong because it is so global. Uh, so there's always going to be someone there to talk uh, about your problem or whatever you might be stuck on. Killer. So let's dive into the UI. So here's what we have uh, when we open up Zap. And the way this is divided up is that we have this uh, site tree on the left. We have our um, our features down here. And so usually on Burp, we have your tabs across the top. Uh, our features are all along the bottom by default when you open this up. We have this workspace window, and this is gonna be showing your requests or responses or any um, context specific thing that needs to get displayed. Then we have this toolbar along the top that helps change the view of some things. It's also where we're gonna find our um, intercepting functionality and some quick browser launches. And we have this footer at the bottom, which shows at the bottom left, the alerts that have been discovered so far, and on the right, kind of statuses of the different tools you might be using. And if you need to find the options to customize or configure anything, you'll go to Tools, and then go down to Options, or you can use the hotkey, or the third option is this little gear icon that's being pointed at right here. When you open up the options, you can see all of the options for all the different tools, features, um, anything else you might want to uh, specifically customize. And so this is what Zap looks like out of the box, but there are ways to make it look a little more burpy, uh, if you would. So the first thing we can do is switch the view to full layout. And so if we were to click this little view button right here, this actually changes and gets rid of uh, permanently keeping the site tree and history available, and goes into full screen mode, which is much more similar to the way Burp works. And we can see all of our tools are now kind of along that top bar right there. And to make it even a little better, we can show all the tools at once. So as you notice this little green plus button, 
By default, Zap doesn't show all of its features and functionality. It actually kind of hides them away so you don't get too overwhelmed at first. But to make it more like BERT, we have everything available at once. If we go into the view options and select show all tabs, we can now see that this toolbar has been expanded and has a bunch more different uh, features there. So this is much more like a BERT kind of feel for Zap. Sweet. And now I want to get into specifically feature parity between the two. So if there's a feature using BERT, where would you find it in Zap? So specifically, I'm going to be diving into all of these tools. So if you're used to using Intruder, if you're used to using Interceptor, how can we use that in Zap? So I'm going to go through each one of these. And some of them are simple shifts. Um, the site map to site tree isn't too different. Um, but some of the other ones, um, Intruder, uh, Interceptor, these do are a little different. I think the explanation does help a little bit. And there's a few other tools that do map over completely uh, that I won't have the time to talk about. Um, but in case you're curious, these kind of have those map over and feel free to hit me up afterwards to understand how that works. So diving into it, uh, we're talking about the site map, it, how it maps to what's called site tree and zap, or the history for both burp and zap. And so if we have our site map uh, on burp here, we can see it's very similar on zap, right? This is our directory structure of the different requests that have been sent. And just like in both Burp, uh, just like in Burp, in Zeb, you can right click and you get a bunch more context about what you can do with these different requests. Um, so in Burp, you have a lot of the typical send to's, uh, send to intruder, send to repeater. In Zeb, it's not as uh, clearly laid out which ones are gonna send to which other features, but all of the different functionality is it there. And with history, uh, it's also pretty, pretty similar between the two. So in Burp, we have uh, the different HTTP history that's been uh, sent. We can see you know, the URL, the method. And in Zap, it looks pretty similar. And if you don't like the headers, if you want the headers to more reflect Burp, you can go in here and customize which, uh, which different fields you're seeing uh, in the history. We can filter our history by scope. So after you've defined what uh, domains or URLs or regexes should be in scope, uh, you can filter your history so it only shows those. If you want to customize even further, you can open up this and really filter out what you want to see in your history. So whether it's by return code, uh, the HTTP method, uh, we can do it by what alerts were found on. So you say, just show me uh, messages that triggered high alerts from the passive or active scanning. And of course, you can right click on it, right? Like, all of Zap features, if you right click on one of these messages, um, tons of different options that we can do. You can add a note to it. So you can um, scribble in some of your thoughts about the specific request. Uh, you can tag it differently. So that it knows, you know, this is a comment, this is a form. Um, you can open up to replay it. All the other uh, things that you might want to do um, just by clicking on a request. The first, uh, the first feature crossover that I think isn't as intuitive is the burp scope to what's called context in Zap. And the reason it's called context and not just scope is because it's actually more than just um, scope. So with uh, Zap context, I almost like to think of it as like application or um, something that holds a little more because really you can define all the information about the app you're testing. So you can define the scope, so include and excludes, uh, but you can also define what technology is being used in there. So you can say, you know, is this Java, is this .NET? Um, and, be, and by defining those, you can customize your scans based off of that. You can also define how the authentication works in here. So you can uh, highlight on a page which form is being used to log in and log out and what indicators show that you're logged in or logged out so that Zap knows how to do that. You can then add uh, users as well. So when you're trying to test some uh, authorization bypass, uh, you can define your different test accounts uh, in the context so you can quickly switch between the two. And there's some other features in here too, um, defining how session management works. Um, so that's why it's different. I think it become a little less intuitive, but once you get used to it, it's actually really powerful to have all that encapsulated in this one idea of a context. 
We have our include and exclude regexes, just like we would have in Burp. And when you want to quickly add something to scope, just like you'd right click and click, say add to scope in Burp, you can right click and zap and say include in context and pick which context you want. You can have multiple contexts running at once. So maybe you're testing one part of a, a site and you want a different site to kind of have this different separate context. Um, you can make multiple contexts. I think the next most common feature that's a little different is intercepting messages. And so with Burp's interceptor, it's actually called break and zap. And the reason it's called break is it's because it was built to reflect like breakpoints uh, in an IDE. And when you want to uh, pick where you want to uh, stop code from executing. So if you look at Burp, you should be pretty familiar with um, here's turning the intercept on or off um, to start and stop it. Uh, the drop button to let messages fall on the floor and the next so you can step from a request to the next response to the next request that was intercepted. What's interesting here is that you notice it says stop and continue. When you turn intercepting off, it allows the messages to flow through. And that's actually a little different in Zap. That's a different thing pulled out. So you can see we have our start stop button. It says red light. So you can turn green to red to turn it on or off. And once a message is intercepted, you can press the next button to step to the next um, uh, HTTP message that's been intercepted to the request or response. Then you can press continue, which will allow the message to go through and then stop intercepting altogether. And so that's a different functionality that's been pulled out. So the most common, I think, workflow in this is you turn intercepting on, you uh, start getting some requests coming in, you step through it until you see the one that you wanted to modify, and then you tweak the one you want to modify and you press continue, it allows that message to flow through and you stop intercepting that point so you can keep going on with your testing. And Zap has custom breakpoints, so you can define whether in the request or response, um, a regex um, or some sort of rule based on it, is so you don't have to click through a bunch. So maybe there's you know, dozens of requests coming through and you just want to find this specific pattern. So you can define that in Burp in the options. And with Zap, you just click the custom breakpoints button right here, and it'll allow you to define the exact same things. So you can choose location, so whether that's the request header, request body, uh, response header. Uh, you can choose how you want to match it. So I mean, exact match, do you want to do regex? You can put the string in there, ignore case. You can see at the bottom of the screen right here, we, have, we can define a bunch of these different breakpoints and just enable them and disable them. So the same functionality between the two. And repeater, this is the one I think is actually uh, the, for how uh, often this feature is used, uh, I think it's uh, easier to find in Burp um, and it's less easy to find in Zap, even though it's still there. And so instead of being repeater, it's called the request editor. And so in Burp, when you right click on a message and send a repeater, gives you this option to start replaying the message, right? You can mess with it, resend it, uh, mess with it again, resend it, see what the server says. And in Zap, it's basically the same flow. You want to right click on the message, so whether it's in your history or your site tree, and then click open, resend with request editor. And so it's the request editor. When you open up the request editor, uh, we'll see the same things where we can now modify uh, the headers or the body of the message and press send to allow it to go through. And now onto Intruder. And this is the most complex of all the tools, the intruding and fuzzing capabilities. So to quickly walk through how uh, Intruder works in Burp, right? Um, there's kind of these, these uh, four steps if you're gonna try to do uh, use Intruder. So the first is to pick your target. So pick what request that you want to start intruding on. And then the second part is you're going to define the positions. And so in this case, you're picking the parameters that you want to start uh, fuzzing or sending payloads at, right? And the way Burp has it set up is that you have target and then you have these tabs, right? Target, position, payloads. And it's kind of this, uh, easy to understand flow to set up your target, then set up your, uh, the parameters you want to start fuzzing and then set up the payloads and processing. So we can highlight all the different things that we may want to, uh, all the parameters we might want to target. 
and then gives you these sniper, battering ram, pitchfork, cluster bomb options, right? These, these great names. And um, if you're not familiar what these different options do, allow you kind of define how the payloads get sent and it allows you to customize uh, how the payloads are structured. So a sniper is going to be um, sending one list of payloads uh, at a parameter. Um, the battering ram is when you want to send, I believe this one's uh, one list of payloads at all of them. The pitchfork is like different lists um, to different payloads to different parameters. And the cluster bomb is like doing every possible iteration of, uh, if you have like multiple lists of payloads, so that every single parameter gets every single option, so that every single possible combination exists there, right? Um, and that specific functionality of simplifying how those payloads are going to run isn't actually found in Zap. And so that's one thing uh, it's a lot easier to do in Burp, but you still can do it. It's just not going to be as in a simple drop down menu. And after you've defined your positions, you're going to choose your payloads. Um, so whether it's just a simple list or um, one of the more complex options uh, available, you're going to pull a file in to do it. And once you pick your payloads, you can pick your processors. So maybe on each um, parameter, you want to add a prefix. You want to add a suffix to it. You want to uh, capitalize something. And that's the processing part. And after that, you've compiled your intruder and you can say, uh, you can start, and it'll start uh, blasting the server you're testing. So in Zap, the intruder functionality is called uh, the fuzzer. And so then you have the fuzzer tool here and you select a new fuzzer. It's a very similar workflow. First, we're going to pick a target, so which request that we want to start fuzzing against. And the key difference is that instead of going one by one through target positions and uh, payloads, we're going to pick one position at a time and define the payloads and processors for each position, for each parameter. So in this case, in the fuzzer menu, we're going to highlight uh, this query parameter and we're going to click add. Now we're defined as a position we want to uh, start fuzzing against. And it'll pop open this payloads option here. When we click add a payload, it'll give us what we want to do, strings, numbers, upload a file. And so now we can define maybe a list of strings. So I've defined some strings here, test, test one. And once we've added those, we can now add the processor. And so right from the same payloads menu, now you dive into the processors. And the same thing, you can prefix, you can hash it through, you can capitalize it, you can write a custom pay, uh, processor, and it'll show you right here, kind of preview of what that uh, processing is going to look like. And once you uh, finish setting that up, now we've got uh, a full parameter, a full position that's been configured. And you can run this for multiple positions at once to start fuzzing. And so that functionality that you've got with uh, Sniper and Battering Ram uh, instead of being able to pick one simple list and say, like, attack each position differently, you would need to define the full combinations that you want it to run against. One nice part about Zap2 is if you're viewing a request, you can just highlight it, right click, and say, start fuzzing this, uh, start fuzzing this parameter right here. And it'll automatically open up the uh, fuzzing menu so you can configure it. And the rest of these, the spider and the active scanning and the store, they're all pretty similar parity wise. You open up a spider, uh, you can start running it and there's a bunch of options and burp. Likewise with Zap, when you pull from the spider tool, you can start a new scan and you can configure all the different options you want in there. One difference is that with Zap, we do have the Ajax spider. And the Ajax spider is focused on um, support for single page applications. And so it's powered by crawljax. And what this does is it uh, monitors different DOM events being triggered and uh, different changes to the way the, the DOM is being manipulated and records all that and starts uh, exploring the application through the DOM as opposed to traditional links and requests. So that's a pretty powerful uh, tool if you're working with uh, single page applications or uh, modern web apps. And the scanner tool in Burp is just called Active Scan and Zap. Uh, so unfortunately, in Burp, uh, the Community Edition, you don't get uh, you don't get uh, the scanning out of the box. 
but they do have a really strong list and a really strong engine uh, that powers Burp. Well, as that, if you open up the active scan tool and start a new scan, you can define where you want to start against. And there's a ton of different uh, customization possibilities to really make sure that the scan is effective for what you're trying to accomplish. And one way to kind of see that is with the policies. So you can define custom scan policies for Zap. And so there's these five different categories on the left and you can pick which different payloads, which different scan rules you want to run. You can define uh, what threshold you want them to trigger on. So do you want to get alerted on like low XSS things? So maybe it's like low uh, likeliness or, or low risk. So you can say like, no, only alert me if it's a high is it the strength, so how, how aggressively it's going to attack the application. And it gives you information about uh, whether it's like a new scan rule or it's been around for a while. So this is nice for us, you can define your custom scan policies so that when you're attacking web application, you're only picking the rules that are applicable to it so that you don't start running a scan for hours, right? With a bunch of rules that aren't even applicable. Or maybe you really only wanna check the XSS and you're not so interested in other stuff, or maybe just the SQLi or maybe just the CSERF. So you can specify which rules you want to run so that your runs uh, are quick and get you the information that you're looking for. And finally, the, the Burp App Store versus the Zap add-on marketplace. As I mentioned before, this is one of the strengths of Burp. It's really cool to see, right, that the popularity, that you can rank them, and it's really strong support for these different add-ons for the, the Burp Store. And the way Zap is actually built is that there's a Zap core part of it, but then everything else is almost, is actually built as an extension too. So while there's maybe not as pretty of a menu here to see, there's actually a lot of uh, different add-ons that are available here. And so the heads up display is actually built as an add-on for Zap. So a lot of the core functionality of Zap is built through the extensions. And so there's a marketplace here where you can build tools uh, or build uh, extensions. You can find add-ons from other people you can see what you already have installed. And by default, several of them get installed. Those are the big things I want to walk through on kind of how to get from burp to zap. We're approaching the halfway mark of the talk here. And so here's a few things that I'm not gonna to touch, but if you're wondering like, oh, can I do these things in zap? Yes, those exist and feel free to reach out to learn more. And there's some other things in zap I just didn't even get to talk about. Um, configuring authentication users. It's really powerful when you get this set up correctly. Uh, the scripting functionality is huge. You can uh, modify on the fly um, these scripting features. So you can say when Zap receives a request or receives a response, automatically do this. You can define a new active scan rule. And there's a bunch of different languages you can actually write that in. And we've got the Zap heads up display, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes now. So we've got all these resources here. So if you get the slide deck, I would highly recommend checking these out. There's tutorial videos, the downloading links, how to get started. Um, and two things at the bottom here from We45 for uh, Abe, and he's got killer stuff. If you wanna start doing more automation or scripting. So this is where, here's a few links. If you wanna find me um, on Twitter, you want to follow Zap. I highly recommend following Zap on Twitter. Uh, we'll be announcing the 2.8 coming out soon. And if you're on Slack, go to the OWASP uh, Slack community and you can find us in the Zap proxy channel where you can just ping me directly. And so that is the first half of this talk. And that is uh, burp to Zap. And again, please ping me um, anywhere on the internet if you've got questions about this. If I don't know it, I will send you to Simon, uh, Simon Bennett's the, the leader for the project and he'll definitely be able to answer your questions. Cool, so I will load up the second talk now. Right on, we will dive right into this then. So this is the second one. This is how you can start doing some bounty hunting with a heads up display. Again, still me. Um, but you might be asking why, why do I need a heads up display, right? Um, sure, maybe there's this cool thing that exists, but like, why is it helpful for me? And so the main driver for the heads up display project 
was that the user experience of security tools is just not great, right? Um, and I'm talking about the two tools I just talked about, Herp and Zap, and I contribute to Zap, right? It's, it's still, everyone can still admit, like they're kind of tough. The user experience isn't quite there. Um, some of the attack proxy workflows, they're just painful, right? When you're trying to intercept messages, you're kind of working between the browser and this other tool. Uh, it's built in Java Swing, which is just, you know, not the prettiest thing these days. And I think the key part though, is that when you're doing any sort of bug bounty hunting, I mean, you're in the browser already, right? So why do we want these tools to be outside of that? Like, let's make it native. Let's build the things into the browser. And that's what the heads of display accomplishes. So it's built to keep you in the flow. So that as you're working through things, um, like you're configuring new users or you're exploring the UI, the heads of display is right there in there for you. It keeps you in the flow as you're working on the project and you can actually customize it for all the workflows you're used to in your browser. So that's why on the Zap Proxy team, uh, I've spent quite a bit of time, Simon, several others, the entire team has worked together to build uh, this heads up display. And what the heads up display is going to do, it's gonna take all of these features that you'd find in Zap, or as you now know, that you'd find in Burp, and it's gonna pull them directly in. So first, let me just show you how you can get started using the heads up display in just a few minutes. So first, we need to start Zap because the heads of display is built as an add-on to Zap. And so first, download and install it. As I showed earlier, you can go to this link, get support for all these different operating systems. Or for the heads of display, if you kind of want to just start it from source, you can clone the Zap HUD repo and just run this Gradle command, run Zap, and it'll automatically pull down the latest weekly release of Zap. Start it so that you're here and ready to go. So once you have Zap up and running, we're going to, just like we showed before, click manually explore, dive in. We're going to define the URL we want to start at. And this time we're going to check the enable HUD button, this checkbox. This is going to start the browser that we get configured with the heads of display running. By pressing launch browser, we don't need to do any certificate configuration. They'll automatically spin it up and you'll be presented with this welcome to the HUD screen overlaid on top of the application that you just typed in. So we can press continue to the target. Thank you for the welcome screen. And here it is. You can see here these buttons on the left and right and this toolbar at the bottom, right over the application we're gonna start testing. So from here, I'm gonna start talking about all the different features of the heads up display. So when you start up uh, your application as we saw, it's actually going to spin up and it'll load uh, these iframes on either side that are on top of the application. And we have these, we call tools, right? These features, we're calling them tools specifically. There's these buttons on the left and right hand side that encapsulate this functionality. And with this toolbar at the bottom, we can find more features of the HUD. So the first group of tools I want to talk about, these tools that are great for exploration. So the site tree, the spider, the active scan, we're pretty familiar with these things, but how does it work in the heads up display? So with our sites tree tool, when we click on that, it's going to pop it open right in the browser for us. And it's going to show us the different ways our uh, app is organized. So here's the uh, rest endpoints for juice shop. If you click in on one, it's going to show you the requests and response that built up uh, that part of the site tree, again, right in the browser. And so once you've explored the site tree a little bit after kind of cruising through the site, you might want to start the spider, right? To start seeing, uh, exploring all the different parts of it. Let's, let's automate this exploration of the site. So when we run the spider in the heads up display, uh, it'll ask you if this is the site you want to do, but it's actually protected by the scope tool. And so this we've simplified context to scope. So if you're not in scope, so we just turned it off of scope, it's gonna ask like, whoa, whoa, this wasn't in scope. Are you sure you wanna spider this? And we're saying, yes, add this site that we want to test to the scope and start spidering it. We're gonna see passive scan rules triggering alerts on the bottom. Uh, this is telling us that Zap has found issues just by spidering it. You can actually see on Juice Shop, uh, it's some challenges got solved just by spidering it. 
And you might have missed it, but from the UI of the HUD, the spider is just going to show a percentage changing in the button right there, letting us know the progress. But in the background, you can see all the requests that just got fired off by Zap. But of course, the whole point of the head to display is that we don't have to see Zap, right? So let's hide the desktop version. And so now with the active scan, let's say now we've spidered it, so now we've got like a pretty good idea of what the footprint of the site is. Now we want to start throwing some payloads at it. So when we use the active scan tool, and we start this, again, we'll see this percentage of on the button slowly start to creep up. And while it looks like there's not a whole lot happening here, in the back, dozens of dozens of requests are being flung at the site right now, uh, all based on the scan pulse that you've established. And if we were to fast forward in this active scan, you can see, again, this growler alert is going to pop up in the bottom right when Zap finds an alert. So that's really cool. And you can click on that growler alert to dive into the alerts. And that's the next part I want to talk about. So now we've done our scanning. And now we should know, like, well, what did Zap find, right? What sort of passive scanning rules, what sort of active scanning rules has it discovered? So we have these flags on the right and left-hand side in these panels. And the right-hand side, it says site alerts, whereas on the left-hand side, it says page alerts. And so the site is the alerts across all of the domain, right? So all of Shop, all the different things. But the page alerts are going to be just the specific URL that we're currently on. So that way, as you're exploring different parts, the ones on the left will change kind of like what alerts were found on the page you're viewing. So we can dive in and say, show me the low alerts, right? And here, say we found um, an XSS header uh, was not set. Um, what about the side alerts? We got these high alerts or these medium alerts. So you can see the count of how many of each one of those are, and it shows us that each instance that it found it at. So in this case, it found uh, five instances of this CSP wildcard in there, right? That's one of the rules. And we can dive into the alert and it shows us the URL it was found. This evidence field where it says like which part of a request or source like triggered the rule. There's a description of it. There's a risk measure, there's confidence, there's information to remediation for it, all built into that single view. So all that's really cool. I mean, alone, that stuff excites me a lot, but I think the real power of the heads-up display is not for these kind of broad um, start a scanner, start a uh, spider, and get the alerts, but it's really about uh, the manual testing aspect of it, right? Uh, viewing specific requests, intercepting messages, and how that workflow changes once you're stuck in the browser. So here's our history tool. And this is just like you'd find in your dev tools in your browser, except this one's backed by Zap. So we can see a list of all the requests that we've sent. And if we click on one, it'll show us the request and response that made it up. And so in this case, we can um, uh, modify anything that we want from here. You can see we have this replay in console and this replay in browser. And so replaying on the console is just like using um, repeater or using uh, the request editor in Berber's app, that it's going to send the request out and it's going to show us the response in this little middle here. So if we were to notice that we've got this basket, and this is where I'm viewing basket four, like, well, that's interesting. Let's change it to a two. What happens if we replay that? Oh, well, we can see in the response that we just viewed someone else's basket. And again, the message is uh, being handled right there in the console. And for breaking, for intercepting messages, this is by far like my favorite uh, workflow change between uh, using desktop version or the heads up display. So for this, we actually have a YouTube video of this one. So we're going to start the intercepting and we're gonna add something to our basket in Juice Shop. So as soon as I click the uh, add to basket button, you'll see that we just immediately intercepted and put the request uh, right in front of the browser. Right. Oh, this is handy. So let's step through that. So now we've let the request through, and now we've just intercepted the response back to the browser. So the heads up display is showing you the response before it gets sent to the browser. And now we can see, okay, this is an interesting response. Let's step through that. And then when we allow that, we intercept this next request. And this looks a little more interesting. It says something about basket items and quantity. So like any good hacker should, right? Let's change this quantity one to negative 100 
and we'll press continue to allow that request through and stop intercepting. And we go to view our basket, you can see we've just added something for negative $200. Like that workflow is so awesome after you've been using uh, Burp or Zap, right? Because you're so used to going into the browser, finding the page you want to go to. Okay, now let's go back to Burp. All right, now let's turn it on. Now let's go back to there. The browser, let's click the thing. Okay, now let's go back to Burp or Zap to see the message we've intercepted. Now let's modify it. Let's go back to it. So you kind of always going between these two things and like why, right? It seems so unnecessary. And so with the heads up display, it's all right there. You don't have to leave that workflow. I love it. So two other really cool tools that are pretty unique to the heads up display. And these are because we're in the browser, we're actually going to modify the application that we're testing to show us things that might otherwise try to be hiding. So in this case, we have this comments tool, which is currently under development. And so with the comments tool, we can add it to our panel because we can add or remove any tools we want. We can customize these panels to have the things that we need. So here it's showing a three. That's saying there's three different HTML comments on this web page. And when we turn it on, it's going to show us these little icons right in the web page where the HTML comment is. And by hovering over it, we can see the contents of it. So in this case, we're on the OWASP wiki page. And these are some really strange messages that are actually auto-generated by the PHP framework that powers the wiki, right? Um, but you can imagine all the different things that you usually want to see. I mean, sure, you could view the source or something like that or build a special rule to create an alert. But why, right? We're already in the browser. We want the browser to tell us when there's something hidden there. And so really a naive example, right? So you have an over the wire challenge is that the first clue is hidden in the comment, spoiler alert. But here, it's pretty cool, right? You can see the password is there. And you can imagine the real case scenarios as I'm sure a lot of uh, you know, bug hunters know, um, this library is out of date. Um, oh, we need to fix this. Things that are really helpful for bug hunting hitting in comments. And the next one is the reveal tool. And so what the reveal does is it will automatically enable any disabled uh, buttons or fields and it'll automatically show any hidden inputs. And so what happens when we run this, if we can see it's got a little six next to it, that means there are six inputs or fields uh, that can be enabled or revealed. So here it's showing us these different hidden inputs that are underneath this form. So we can see what's like a C-serve token, some extra metadata there. And if there was any button that was disabled so that you couldn't click through it, you could enable it and start detecting um, any lack of server-side validation. Like that's awesome, right? We're modifying the web app to tell us what we want to know. And I'm really bummed about this. I didn't get, uh, this slide is really blurry. And so you're not gonna be able to see it good. So I might, um, if possible, I'll send out a better uh, screenshot or video of it. But with the advanced testing, we can do uh, this focus scan. And what it'll do, it'll uh, run the active scanner against a single, uh, a single request. And if it finds any issues, you might be able to see it through the blurriness. Um, when it finds an issue, it'll uh, alert us, but then it'll automatically highlight the form where it found the issue. So I think, yeah, it's a little blurry, um, but what's happening here is that we submit something to this and uh, Zap detects, um, or in this case, yeah, so we're gonna open up the request that we just sent and we're on the active scan. So this is that focus scan. And we just hit that specific request. So it's like, oh, we found a cross-site scripting in this form. I'm like, what? That's really cool. Uh, here's the description of it. But what's cool though, is that we can scroll up and say, well, you found this alert, show me the URL. And when we go to the page, it's now marked up our web app to say, look, there's a problem right here. And if you click on the little flag, it's like, here's the details. And if you click on the request that sent it, you can see what the payload was and say, replay in browser and trigger the attack that caused that XSS. And there it is. Like, that's so cool. That is so many features jammed into one. Like my division for the heads of display going forward, right, is that the forms will be marked up and outlined like, uh, hey, there's alerts here. And you can replay them right in the browser without having to try to relaunch or copy and paste into curl or all this other nonsense. Um, that is one of the beautiful combinations, uh, a little blurry. And so hopefully we can find a better one to send out to y'all. And the last thing is uh, customizing the HUD. And so what we have here is the ability to create your own tool in the heads up display in less than a few minutes. 
So if I play uh, this video here, what we're gonna see is we've got a Zap desktop open. We've just opened the scripts functionality of it. What this is, you can see on the left side there is all these different places that you can hook into Zap. So you can um, write something or the one, write custom functionality when authentication happens. You can write a script to run anytime something gets intercepted. But you'll also, and so we'll see here, we've defined a script. And this script is called Hackett. It's called Hackett.zst, Zest. And so that's a visual programming language that Mozilla, Mozilla developed that Zap uses. But that Hackett.zst file, that could be anything. That could be JavaScript, uh, it could be Ruby. I think we, there's support for Python as well. So you could write this JavaScript, uh, quick little um, snippet that says, you know, when I receive a request, modify it as such and return it back. In this case, we have uh, a script called Hackett. And what Hackett does is it's going to, every time a message is uh, intercepted, it's gonna check the response body and it's gonna replace any indication of the word juice shop with the word hacked. So kind of a silly script, right? But again, whatever sort of custom functionality you usually run, you can put in there. So we've got this script enabled, right? And we wanna add this functionality to the HUD. So notice too, in the scripts console, we have something called HUD. And underneath it, this is actually all the files that make the heads up display run. So you can modify the heads up display within Zap. You don't need to open up any code editors or anything. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna scroll down and find an existing tool. And we're going to um, just copy and paste it and change a few, uh, a few of the different properties in here to make our new tool. So we're gonna change the name of the tool. It's called uh, Hack It, right? And we're gonna change uh, the label, right? This is what's presented on the button of the tool. And we're gonna change what happens, uh, the dialog for when we turn it on and off. So I was gonna say start Hack It or stop. And after we change these four fields, there's only two other things we actually need to change. And so we wanna enable this script we've just defined, this hackit.zst script. And so we're gonna use the Zap REST API. So Zap REST API has the ability to turn scripts on and off, and we leverage that in the heads up display. So we just modify uh, this API request we're sending to enable it when we turn it on and to disable the script when we turn it off. And once we change this last field, we're actually done. We hit this save and we've just built a brand new tool for the heads up display. And if we were to launch the browser and uh, go to the set we want to test and let the heads up display load on top of it, you'll see that when we click that plus button to configure our panels on left and right, what tools we want to run, we should have a new tool available to us. So we'll plus this, press this little plus button and there it is, hack it. Like that wasn't there before, we just added that. And when we turn it on, it's gonna ask us, do you wanna start? I'm like, yep, that sounds good. So when we refresh the page, because Zap has just proxied the word juice shop, you can see at the top, it says hack now. Like that's killer. That was less than a few minutes and we just developed a whole new tool and a whole custom functionality for the heads up display. And again, a silly script maybe, but any of those, whatever tooling you use on the side, you can build it into the heads up display. So just to give you an idea of what's next, like what are the things that we're thinking about? So a couple of things that I think would be really cool for bounty hunting, right, is building in tools for with, uh, built with a Wappalizer to understand the tech stack that you're working with, right? If someone's not familiar with these tools, to let you know um, like what server technology is using, uh, if they're using any frameworks or uh, libraries on the client side. I want to add the ability to add notes. And so Zap already has this built in. You can add custom notes to requests or alerts or responses. So we want to expose that to the heads of display and pairing notes with this idea of visual markup. There was, used to be this old uh, extension where uh, you could scribble over web pages and each web page you went to, a different one, you could see the scribbles that everyone had written. And it's the same idea here. It'd be neat to have in your notes or in your requests and responses that when you go view that same web page, you can see like maybe some, you've drawn an arrow to a button you want to play with, or you said you circled something that looks a little funky. And then adding just more support in for the things that everyone's going to want when they're testing. Uh, viewing local storage and session storage. 
sure, you can open up dev tools and see these things, but why not have a built in the heads up display where Zap can mark up the things that we know to be interesting and expose those things uh, right to the forefront. Adding support for indexed DB uh, for cookies and parameters. Uh, so any query parameters, you can see those and automatically start uh, fuzzing or inspecting what's going on underneath the hood. One thing I think would be killer is switching users. So having this users tool, so that when you open up this users tool, it'll automatically load up the different test accounts you have ready. And you can simply click on each one of those to toggle between which test account you're in. So when you're doing authorization bypass testing, you can quickly just switch from one user to another to see if you got access to somebody else's information. And the thing that I'm actually working on next is form injection, which I am so excited for. It's the idea that when you have a form pop up, you've got some sort of input field, some sort of search field, just like we saw that you get marked up with the red box and that red flag when there was an alert on it, I want the ability just to add a crosshair next to every single form. And when you click on this crosshair, it says, what sort of attack payloads do you want to send? Do you want to send XSS? Do you want to send SQL I? Do you want to send your custom payloads? So that you can immediately view a form, click the crosshair, click the payloads, and just start firing off against it. Like that would be like my favorite, I think, workflow of the heads up display. So I'm really excited to start working on that. And some more uh, still working on the road. We want to package up these tools, right? So that um, other people can contribute the tools they build, build a tool store, uh, make it easier to drag and drop and really make the heads up display work for however each person's custom workflow uh, is. So if you want to learn more, um, lots of content out there. Uh, we have a blog, there's a blog post that's available. And um, you can check that out here. There's lots of different talks about it. Um, Simon Benz has given several. Here's mine. Uh, you can find these on YouTube. Um, the usable security tooling one actually goes in the nitty gritty of how the HUD works behind the scenes. It's really interesting. When you start up the HUD, there's actually an option to take a tutorial. And so when you do that, I highly recommend that you take this tutorial and show you a few more nuances about each different feature that's available. And docs are coming soon. We're really trying to invest heavily in docs for the heads of display, so it makes sense for everyone. So please go give it a try. Uh, give us your feedback. We, we've been building this thing. It's just, you know, we had an alpha release uh, a couple months ago, and the beta release is coming out with Zap 2.8. So please give us your feedback. It all helps. Reach out to us wherever. Um, yeah, and here's, again, the places where you can find me or anything about the Zap or HUD. Uh, there's the GitHub. Uh, GitHub repo right there, and you can find us on zap hud on the lost flack group. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in. I appreciate it. Great job, David. Dude, that was that was super awesome. Everybody in the chat's really excited about the HUD. Um, <laughs> That's I, awesome. I, I could already think of like I could already think of like ten things like tools that are outside of my workflow or things I have to do on the command line that like if they were available to me through the web browser, I would either A, forget, or not forget to do them, or B, just do them at least two or three times as fast. So I'm, right. I'm super excited. That's awesome. That, yeah, excites me to hear that kind of feedback. And yeah, definitely hit me up afterwards and I'll, I'll get you hooked up with how we can start building a lot of these cool things. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, man. That was, both, both talks were really good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Y'all have a good rest of your day.